Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm I'm glad to present now this uh, the speaker of this seminar uh, is um, Gabriele Bruni. Hello. So, um, is, um, Gabriele work here, works here with the integral group and I, and I summarize briefly his career. Uh, he, take, uh, he took his degree in, in Turin with a thesis on a high energy sources, gamma ray sources. And then he moved to Bologna uh, to the Institute of Radioastronomia with a thesis on, on quasars. And then he had uh, several postdocs. Um, the first one in Granada, then he moved to Max Planck Institute uh, for Radioastronomy, working in a group of WellBI. Well and, uh, and then uh, in Bonn until 2017. And uh, finally, he moved here in EAPS with a postdoc doc position uh, with a, in a, working with the integral group and working with the um, high energy source with accretion and ejection uh, synergies in high energy sources. Um, now is uh, one last year, he, uh, he, we won uh, as a grant. So he's paid now by himself, by his own <laughs> money. <laughs> and he's, um, and now he's present his project. He's, he, he's uh, probably the only one radio astronomer in EAPS. <laughs> and Rome. <in> Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he's, uh, now he's present his project, uh, the GRACE project, uh, working with, uh, talking about uh, radio galaxies. Grazie, Fiamma. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So today I want to, to summarize the goals of this project that was started a few years ago, but received a new, new, a new wave of uh, uh, funding through this ESA fellowship. So I, I plan for the next two years, uh, a lot of activities on uh, high energy sources and in particular on, on jets produced by these uh, gamma resources. Ah, qui c'è il solito problema come che non cambia slide ecco. no, 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 Okay, so now it works. Okay, uh, okay, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, let's talk about jets in a creating system. Jets are a sort of byproduct of a creating system. Mm -hmm. They are ubiquitous. You can find them in uh, different uh, sites, black hole from uh, stellar black hole to supermassive one in EGS. And you have mainly uh, three crops that you can play with. Where you try to generate jet, accretion rate, magnetic field, and the spin of the black hole. Uh, through these three parameters, you can have um, uh, a, a radiatively inefficient accretion if you have uh, uh, less than 1% of Eddington limit uh, in accretion rate, or you can have a radiatively efficient accretion in disk uh, if you go beyond 1% or less. While the uh, magnetic fields is necessary uh, to thread and to accelerate the jet, uh, but without the spin of the black hole, you cannot create these helical magnetic fields that I will show you later and that have been observed and that are necessary to create this magnetic tower that generates the uh, uh, potential uh, to launch particle uh, up to uh, a fraction of the speed of light. So you have these three uh, ingredients on different scales, also on, uh, on stellar mass black holes, in TDEs, and even gamma ray bars where you can find jets as well. 
And uh, depending on the regime, the accretion regime that you have, you can have a dominance of the jet in the uh, energy out, uh, budget, or uh, you can have a, a dominance of the accretion, these collecting quasars. So uh, the, the, as I briefly mentioned, the launching mechanism uh, and, um, uh, it's not completely clear yet. I mean, we started from the 70s trying to explain how you can create these relativistic flows. So there are two main two main models, blunt for the night, where the jet is formed by the ergosphere of the black hole, and the blunt for pain, where the accretion disk is the one that launches uh, the jet at the beginning. But uh, uh, lately, we have seen that at least in the most powerful jets, like uh, the one that you find in Panor of Raleigh to radio galaxies, the most extended one, um, a combination of the two processes is, is necessary to create this uh, structured jet with different layers, where you can see an external layer, a slower layer interacting with the medium, and a, a faster spine that uh, uh, carries uh, most of the energy. Uh, through the flow. So um, most probably it's not black and white, but it's a combination of the two processes depending on the accretion mode uh, regime. So when you try to study jets, um, of course, uh, radio is uh, the main actor. You can use uh, radio photons to probe uh, different scales. Uh, you can see uh, the jet structure uh, create these plumes and extend the structures that you can find uh, even on kiloparsec scale. But if you zoom in, you start seeing uh, the internal part, the collimated part of the jet before it gets disrupted by the interaction with the medium. And if you zoom further, you start seeing the fine structure of this jet with the, uh, the external layers that, that I was mentioning before, even more uh, visible at millimeter wavelengths and uh, uh, down to the uh, event horizon uh, scale that, that has been observed just a few years ago, thanks to a huge effort of the event horizon telescope collaboration. So um, if you want to move towards the event horizon or the black hole, you need to not only to improve your resolution, but also to increase uh, the frequency that you are using to probe the jet, since the most internal regions are the one that emits at shorter wavelengths. So if you divide the jet into four main regions um, from the uh, just up to above the event horizon, you have the launching region. Then you have an acceleration and collimation region that is almost uh, at the scale of one parsec. And then it enters the uh, kinematic flux dominated region where it, it gets uh, basically ballistic, and you can see the, the extended jets on hundreds of parsec up to kiloparsec scale, just like the ones that you see in radio galaxies. And finally, you have the dissipation region that is the one when, when these uh, plumes are, are created by interaction with the medium. So uh, you can see there is a very different scale that you need to probe. Uh, the millimeter uh, band can cover the most inner, the innermost part of the jet, but if you want to go further up, you need to use uh, optical X-rays, as I will show you, and it has uh, has been done recently by XPay mission. So, uh, just to give you some highlights on the latest result, um, uh, there was a, a mission, a radio mission named Radio Astron. It was a space mission that worked up to 2019 that could provide uh, an exceptional uh, angular resolution in the uh, gigahertz domain to probe the fine structure of the jets. So here are two uh, results. Uh, the first one in 3C273, you can see this helical pattern uh, created by the external layer of the jet. And this was resolved and studied thanks to the extreme resolution of space VLBI at 1.4 gigahertz. So it's something you cannot do uh, from Earth. You need a, an antenna that is far enough to get this resolution, to access this scale. And uh, the second one is uh, the recently published uh, Natural Astronomy paper by the Radio Astron Collaboration that shows you how you have these filaments inside the jet, that thread the jet, and confirm uh, what we were uh, 
trying to uh, explain as a, a, an helical magnetic field trading the jet. So uh, the more we uh, delve into the jet structure, the more we see uh, the peculiar and fine structure of the jet, confirming what we, we were uh, thinking. Uh, finally, of course, the uh, recent expert result that confirms the presence of a shocking jet uh, at the jet base that allowed to uh, finally see what was uh, predicted uh, not only in 2018, this is a review, but this was predicted in the 80s, in the 90s by the Marshall uh, group uh, about the presence of a jet at the very base of the, uh, of the uh, uh, sorry, presence of a shock at the very base of the jets, uh, the region that you can access only with optical and then also X-ray uh, band emission. So um, evidence are mounting uh, about what we were thinking about jets, but see there are uh, a lot of open questions, not only about the uh, launching of the jets itself, but also about how, which are the conditions that trigger the formation of the jet and possibly uh, the restarted jets so where you can see more than one jet in the same source uh, along uh, mega years. So uh, it is important to answer this question to study the uh, recently restarted jet, like the one I will show you today at parsec scale resolution to see what are the conditions that trigger the new phase. And also it's important to understand how the jet evolved and what's its dynamic in the host galaxy. So uh, studying the mega parsec scale lobes and morphology, you can see how the jet impact into the host galaxy. And this is um, important for feedback and uh, cell formation regulation uh, in the host galaxy itself. And uh, also, if you spot any hint of jet precession, uh, you can uh, try to understand whether a possible binary supermassive black hole is present in the core uh, of these systems. Uh, binary black hole that will be most probably detected by the next generation of uh, gravitational wave detectors that will probe the low frequency gravitational wave domain dominated by supermassive black hole. And uh, finally, what's the jet's duty cycle? Uh, to do this, you have to apply a more complex technique that is a synchrotron aging that is able to date the different regions of the lobes and the jets and the inner part of the jet uh, emission, uh, trying to understand uh, what's the on-off period of these jets and what possibly triggers them. So all these points are important to understand how jets are created, evolve, and their impact on the on the host galaxy. So the AGN host galaxy uh, coevolution uh, issue. So why um, radio galaxy at high energy? In the in the past year, we devoted an effort to the study of these uh, extended structures uh, that are also detected at high energy with uh, with the integral and swift. Um, these are interesting because, of course, there are not many. You cannot build, a, you cannot easily build a, uh, a very big sample of these objects. But uh, the few objects that you can study um, that are more or less 8% of the integral sample and 1% of the Fermi AGN sample uh, offer the possibility to uh, connect, put in connection and study synergies between the accretion status and the uh, jet production and uh, evolution. Uh, for example, the very extended radio sources like this one that are traditionally the uh, classified as Phanoropharyl 2, where the lobes of in its emission uh, are usually produced by systems that are highly accreting. So if you select high energy sources, you, uh, you have a good proxy for high accretion, high uh, editor rate, and you can see what's the uh, evolution of the accretion once it enters the jet channel and creates this extended structure. So putting together radio and high energy is important to uh, build a puzzle of these uh, accretion ejection synergies. So we, we are concentrating mainly on two classes that are the, the, uh, the hard X-ray giant radio galaxies and the GV radio galaxies. 
uh, we study them uh, through the synergy with uh, uh, ground facilities and uh, latest radio surveys like the GSS, LOFAR, uh, RAGS, that is a precursor of uh, SKA, and the new uh, survey by the VLA, that is the VLAS survey. So uh, thanks to this new uh, generation of radio survey, we have a, a, a larger census of these galaxies and we can study uh, their evolution. In particular, if you put together the VILA survey and the RAX survey, uh, you have a, a, an entire sky coverage because uh, one's covered the northern and the other one the southern hemisphere. So you can really uh, trace the population of radio sources detected at high energy by Fermi integral and Swiss. So let's start with the hard X-ray uh, giant radio galaxies. <clears throat> so when you have a, a radio galaxy, you can expect a, a life cycle like this, with uh, starting with a very compact radio source with a jet that is uh, below or comparable to one kiloparsec in linear extension that uh, uh, later can evolve into a final probably one or two uh, radio source that is extended, that is, that is the traditional radio galaxy class. And eventually it can get, some of them can reach um, giant size that is larger than uh, uh, 0.7 kiloparsec, almost one meg megaparsec. And this uh, class of radio sources is also important for their interaction in the environment because they can probe the uh, intracluster medium, and they can have an effect on the uh, plasma populating the intracluster medium. And finally, uh, when the core is not active anymore, you have these relic uh, radio lobes without uh, an active core that are classified as dying radio galaxies. So the, the giant radio galaxies in particular, uh, as I say, they are uh, almost one megaparsec in uh, linear size, but they have a low surface brightness because these lobes, extended lobes uh, of plasma, uh, have a very low uh, flux and when you try to serve them at high resolution. So uh, historically, uh, they were only between one and 6% of the um, traditional radio catalogs like first and VSS, just because you need a, a very high sensitivity and resolution to identify them. Uh, thanks to LOFAR <coughs> that is producing a new uh, radio survey at, uh, in the megahertz domain, the census of this object increased to 500, uh, more or less 500, that it allows for the first time to have these uh, population studies, understanding what allow just to grow up to this size, whether it's only an accretion, uh, uh, very high accretion, a very powerful engine that allows you to to uh, create powerful jets extending up, up to the megaparsec scale, or whether it's only an, uh, an environment, uh, a positive environment that uh, allow to grow, uh, allow the jet to grow thanks to a lower density maybe. So this is still uh, to be understand. And uh, um, giant radio galaxy are also an important uh, subsample to study the duty cycle of jets because you can have more than one radio phase. If you consider that the lobes have been produced in almost 100 mega years, you have plenty of time to create a new radio phase. So and they are an important aspect to, uh, to study the jet duty cycle. So the, the hard X-ray giant radio galaxy sample that we are studying has been built uh, cross-correlating the historical radio service because uh, uh, the project started a few years ago uh, with uh, the uh, integral and swift uh, samples of high energy uh, of vertex ray sources. Uh, what we found, it was that uh, 67 uh, objects had a, a radio galaxy-like morphology with two lobes and uh, third, uh, 15 uh, can be classified as giant radio galaxy because they're larger than 0.7 megaparsec. This is already a fraction that is four times higher than what you find in uh, 
in uh, historical radio catalogs. So we were puzzled by this uh, higher fraction of uh, giant radio galaxy when you start from the high energy selection, high energy catalogs. And we, we uh, started the campaign to understand why we see these uh, this kind of objects. So what you observe, um, let's say, well, the kind of objects that you pick up when you start from the high energy selection is a, a high energy radio, high, uh, highly excited radio galaxy that are hergs, uh, that are, uh, as we discussed before, uh, AGN that are accreting uh, a lot. So they are really uh, luminous in other X-ray because they have a uh, high uh, accreting regime. And uh, uh, you can have both type one and type two, but uh, of course you don't pick up uh, the low excitation radio galaxies like uh, LERCs or liners or uh, traditional Seifert that are fainter. So um, how to spot uh, more than one radio phase in uh, radio sources? Uh, you can have different indicators of uh, a new radio phase, uh, starting from the classical double-double radio galaxies where you see two uh, couples of lobes. One, uh, the most external one, trace the previous radio phase, while the internal one are the new jet that has been ejected uh, a few mega years ago. Uh, another way is to spot for these peculiar morphologies like a shaped uh, radio galaxy. You can see apparently there are two axes for the radio emission. Uh, in most of cases, the, the internal structure is created by backflow of plasma that is reflected by the host galaxy but in some cases it's, it's really a, a new radio phase a new jet with a different axis with respect to the previous jet so uh, a change in the jet axis can trace something more interesting in the central engine and um, we are still studying this kind of objects another possibility is that you have a cocoon a radio cocoon emission enveloping the uh, radio source uh, that is a relic of a previous radio phase that uh, has been expanding for a million of years and is now just a, a, a diffuse emission, very low surface emission uh, region. Or finally, you can have a, an extended radio galaxy with a core that presents a peak spectrum a peak spectrum in the radio uh, band uh, can be an indicator of a young radio phase because the new jets are still small and you can have a self synchrotron self absorption that produces this peaked uh, radio SED. So uh, to do this, you need to observe uh, uh, the core at high resolution and trying to build the multi-frequency SED and try to spot a new radio phase. So using these four tools, we studied uh, our sample of hard X-ray giant radio galaxies. Uh, six of them already presented signs of restarting activity from uh, previous uh, studies in the literature. So it's already 40%. It is quite high. Uh, but in addition to this, we uh, studied the core radio spectra, as I just said, and also the morphological uh, uh, structure to spot one more, more than one radio phase. So to do this, we use the TGSS, LOFAR, and also the latest uh, uh, radio surveys. The first result was um, uh, the finding of a peaked uh, radio spectra that could indicate the presence of a new radio phase. So we find that almost 60% uh, of the sample has this kind of radio core that is uh, something new for giant radio uh, galaxies like this one. Uh, as you can see here, uh, if you zoom into the core, you can see still a, a core jet morphologies and a peak uh, spectrum. Uh, this is even more a uh, zoom with a parser scale observation. Via the observation, you can see the internal jet is, uh, that has been recently launched. And, and yet you see, uh, the peaked uh, radio spectrum. So uh, thanks to our work, plus previous studies in the literature, we found that almost all uh, giant radio galaxies selected in the hard X-ray 
uh, band uh, show more than one radio phase. And um, this is interesting because almost in the same time, in 2015, uh, uh, people started uh, studying the correlation between radio phases and high energy uh, emission, finding that Herx radio galaxy, high excitation radio galaxy, can have shorter radio phases. So the fact that you see uh, so many restarted radio galaxies in this sample could be uh, related to the fact that high energy, uh, high, uh, highly excited radio galaxy can have shorter radio phases. So if you pick up the, the giant radio galaxy that have, uh, have million of years to evolve, you can spot one the, more than one uh, radio phase thanks to the accretion. So this will link the uh, radioactivity to the accretion mode of the central AGN. As, as we were uh, trying to do. <laughs> so, um, Lofer, um, in, uh, in 2015, uh, sorry, in 2019, we could access the uh, Lofer collaboration for the LOTS survey, so we could have access to the latest data collected uh, for the uh, uh, LOTS survey at 150 megahertz, and thanks to the superb uh, uh, angular resolution and sensitivity of LOFAR, we could study some of our objects that were in the footprint of this survey, uh, seeing new details that were not spotted before. For example, this is one of the most interesting sources. Um, we could see this uh, diffuse emission that is not aligned with the central uh, axis of the lobes. Uh, this is an intervening radio galaxy, you can ignore that. Uh, plus, we could zoom into the core of this radio galaxy, seeing that uh, the internal jet axis is different, uh, almost 30 degrees different from the ones that you would um, reconstruct, connecting the core and the bow shock that indicates the uh, active part of the emitted plasma when uh, uh, intercept the medium. So. More of these sources uh, uh, can be found when you observe a low frequency, high resolution, and high sensitivity. This is a, another one. Uh, for the first time, we could see this uh, extended emission that is more extended than the lobes, and it's on a different axis of the lobes. And this is what you expect from jet precession uh, as predicted by simulation, very recent simulation that shows you how these structures can be uh, generated by a processing uh, jet. So uh, you basically have a cone that is created during a precession with the new uh, phase that is uh, more luminous while the, the previous jet axis uh, uh, leaves these relics that are only detectable at low frequency, high sensitivity and allows you to reconstruct the, the evolution and uh, uh, the evolution of the jet. So for a system like this, as I was mentioning before, you can have a precession due to uh, possibly a binary supermassive black hole, or you can have also uh, accretion instabilities that uh, cause the accretion disk to uh, wobble. And uh, you can have these uh, different uh, uh, axis direction for the jet during the uh, wobbling of the, of the accretion disk. Uh, so uh, just this year, uh, as Fiamma mentioned, we got these uh, new funds from ESA to run the project. Uh, we, we could convince the ESA panel that uh, putting together high energy and uh, radio is something interesting to do. So uh, we got this funding for two years that uh, will allow us to uh, further develop the project. We have already a lot of data that we uh, accumulated in past years and deserve full attention. Uh, one of the main points would be, as I was mentioning, to compare the HERG and LERG classes. Uh, we have already uh, built a HERG, giant radio galaxy sampling. We want to compare that with uh, traditionally radio selected radio galaxies uh, that are uh, LERGs to understand how the accretion mode can influence the jet uh, production, the jet duty cycle. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, we have um, uh, data for a, a pilot sample of three giant radio galaxies for which we want to perform the synchrotron aging uh, analysis that allows you to date the different region of the lobes and again deduce the um, duty cycle of the jet when what more than one uh, radio phase is present. And also we have uh, a large uh, program that we perform with the EVN, the European VLBI network, that will allow us to uh, probe the innermost region of the jets, and in particular the restarted one, trying to understand what triggered these uh, uh, restarted activities. Plus, uh, we we also plan to do an archives mining, both in X-rays and radio bands, to uh, to build a uh, possibly build a. Uh, a variability uh, to track the variability of these sources in X-rays and radio, and trying to see how uh, a different accretion regime uh, along years can result in uh, in a new radio phase or in a different radio emission. Uh, this is more ambitious, of course, but uh, we have now more than twenty years of data, both from uh, high energy missions and radio data. So it's really possible to do these kind of studies that are a bit uh, uh, time consuming, but they can give you information about the evolution of AGM. Okay, so what about GV radio galaxy? They're even more extreme. And uh, when I'm talking about GV, I'm talking about uh, Fermi uh, lat detected radio galaxies. So as you as you might know so far, uh, Fermi could resolve only a few sources. Uh, Centaurus A and Fornax A, for example, are um, two radio galaxies that are extended enough to be resolved even at Fermi lat resolution, uh, because they have a, a linear session of several degrees. And lobes uh, could also be detected in gamma rays, not only the core. That is. Uh, um, interesting because it gives you information about the uh, plasma uh, energy distribution in the lobes. A first modeling of this uh, GV emission from the lobes uh, considered the proton-proton collisions. It is the most obvious way to produce such high uh, energy photons, but these also imply a very high uh, proton uh, energy density in the lobes that might be non-trivial because the lobes are extended uh, regions with plasma that have had enough time to relax and to irradiate uh, the energy. Uh, so it's not obvious that you have such high uh, energy protons in the lobes. Uh, but uh, recent works uh, by, by enough people, uh, Persich and Raffaele, uh, demonstrated how uh, you can have this gamma ray emission in the lobes tend to the inverse uh, Compton of the electrons uh, forming the plasma. So not protons, but electrons of the ambient medium, uh, the ambient photon field. It is composed, of course, by ACMB plus the OS galaxy star, uh, starlight plus the external background, background light uh, present in the, in the uh, volume of the lobes. So uh, in this way, uh, you can more naturally explain why you have GEV emission uh, in the lobes without requiring protons. And uh, we try to uh, apply this modeling to one interesting radio galaxy that uh, belongs to the integral sample, but has also been detected by Fermilat. We could study this source thanks to the latest generation radio survey that I was mentioning before. This is the uh, Rax image of 0.8 gigahertz, and this is the Vilas uh, image uh, at three gigahertz and a higher resolution that allows you to resolve the two lobes and the core. And this is the XMM detection of the core. <laughs> and thanks to the uh, spectral covering of uh, lobes and core, we could build this uh, broadband SCD where you can see the lobes contribution to the radio band here, the core contribution here. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that if you 
um, if you try to fit this uh, broadband emission using the 3C273 3, template that has been done by the Fermi collaboration in one of the first uh, works, you can see that the gray line falls well below the uh, Fermilat, uh, uh, emission, uh, Fermilat flux of GV energy. So this is almost one order of magnitude. So it means that you have a GV emission that is 10 times larger than, than what you would expect from the radio power of the core. And this requires some more ingredients to explain this uh, high energy emission. So we, we applied the modeling that I was mentioning before, uh, uh, considering the uh, GV emission of the lobes. And uh, thanks to this, uh, we could constrain the, the lobes energy, the uh, plasma energy uh, through the uh, radio emission that we see from radio service. And we could model what we expect in the GV band, and we could fit the three points uh, by Fermilab. So this suggests that uh, there might be a substantial contribution from the lobes, uh, even at high energy, a GV domain. And uh, this is very interesting for the next generation of uh, radio telescopes that will uh, identify more um, Fermilat sources that, that are not blazer, so the, the, the classically uh, named uh, misaligned AGN that uh, uh, should have this GV emission from components that are not the core, as you would expect in blazer. And indeed, using the, these uh, latest uh, surveys, we could identify more Fermilat sources that are uh, resolved in the radio band. Here you can see uh, the contours from RACs and the uh, colors from BILAS, that is higher resolution. So these four sources are an example of what you get once you go deeper in the radio sky and cross-correlate what you see with high energy catalogs. So this is, to me, uh, a very interesting research line for the next uh, generation of a uh, radio telescope plus uh, high energy uh, satellites. And indeed, thanks to the agreement between ENAF and uh, the uh, SCA Observatory, we will be able to uh, use the uh, first data produced by, by the MIRCAT plus survey. MIRCAT is uh, another precursor of uh, SKA in South Africa. And uh, we plan to use this data to study uh, high energy sources, uh, spotting more extended radio sources in the gamma ray sky. So finally, just let me say a few words about a uh, possible connection between neutrinos and radio galaxies. Um, as you know, so far there, there, there has been only one association of a neutrino with a, a blazer. Uh, blazer are objects where um, the jet point towards you, so they can be considered a radio galaxy where the jet point towards Earth. Uh, but there might be more classes of objects uh, that can be linked to neutrino emission. For example, uh, very recently, the Antares collaboration published uh, a catalog cross-correlating the neutrino events with uh, different uh, astrophysical catalogs, including uh, our catalog of uh, uh, hard X-ray uh, radio galaxy from Integral and Swift. And uh, their, um, their cross-correlation suggests that, of course, there is a blazer, but also a radio galaxy uh, from, the, from the Integral sample that has a, a, a sigma T is slightly more than three to belong uh, to, to be associated with a neutrino event. So we, we perform an archival study of this source. Uh, of course, we want to, to get more Antares events to confirm this association because the, the significance is not so high. But in the meantime, we can try to study uh, what is the source and why it should emit neutrinos. Um, these are uh, archival uh, images in the radio band. You can see that the radio morphology is uh, complex. You have two main lobes. Uh, you have this extended emission that is most probably just a backflow of plasma from the lobes toward the core. 
so it's not an, an active radio base, but it's just a, a result of the main radio phase that you see here producing the lobes. But if you zoom in the center, you can see that the internal jet has an axis that is different from the one connecting the lobes. And when you see this S-shaped uh, radio morphology, um, uh, it can suggest a precession of the jet. Uh, if you zoom in uh, into the core with the VLBA at partial k resolution, you can see a core jet uh, structure that is suggesting that the, the, the jet is pointing more towards you than, than on the plane of the sky, because you have this asymmetric radio structure. And also the axis that you can trace here uh, is in agreement with the one of the internal uh, lobes that you see here. So this could be a processing jet. And uh, it's interesting that processing jets have been proposed to be neutrino emitters because uh, when you have this um, uh, processing uh, uh, axis, you can have interaction between the jet and the broadline region. So you can have more, uh, you can possibly have proton-proton interactions that produce uh, uh, a chain of byproducts sending with uh, neutrinos. So this is really interesting. We want to study more in detail this source. Uh, in the best case possible scenario, this could be the first radio galaxy with the neutrino association, but we, we need more Antares data to confirm the neutrino link. And also we need more uh, broadband data to study this source. Anyway, from archival data, we already perform a first study and we see that it, it's very variable, both in X-rays, in red and in radio. And this suggests that the precession might be real. So uh, this is everything I have to say. I try to show you all the activities we have here in EAPS about radio uh, sources. You can find more details on the website and uh, we are also uh, running a mini uh, radio astronomy lab at Sapienza uh, in the past three years. And so we have some students that are uh, coming for thesis. And of course, if you are interested in working with us, we have more data to give you <laughs> for thesis or PhDs. So thank you very much.